I believe that we, we can start. I can see Jonathan uh, uh, ready and I can say, well, thank you very much. And we are um, starting this afternoon after the fantastic session of the morning. I, I really learned a lot and it was really enlightening. Uh, we are starting a session that has a, a different character. We, we've called it institutional, but I was trying to explain at the beginning of this uh, event this morning. Uh, it's actually, we, we are going to uh, listen from institutions and organizations that are dealing with uh, 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 these uh, uh, risks uh, from, uh, from a different perspective. Some of them are focused on one particular uh, uh, source of the risk, for instance, infectious diseases. Others are dealing with an array uh, uh, at the regional level, for instance, at the geographical level. No? The purpose of this session is to review these initiatives uh, related to this PR3 model that we described uh, 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 this, uh, this morning. And this, uh, ideally, should help institutions to identify new areas for collaboration and engagement, both from the scientific community and also from the practitioners that are uh, present here. No? Since there are a, a number of speakers this afternoon, we are going to divide it in two blocks. The first one is the one that we are beginning now. And uh, we are going to have presentations uh, in, in this order uh, from Jonathan Abraham, who is a technical officer uh, for disaster risk management and in the, in the disaster risk management and resilience unit at the WHO in the Sendai framework for disaster risk reduction. Then we will hear from David Lawrence from the Global Fund uh, against uh, HIV, malaria, and TB. He's a senior advisor on COVID-19 and PPR. Then we will listen uh, from Ammieke Van Dam. Uh, she is from EGRIN. She's a member of the European Global Health Research Institute's uh, network, and she's also the chef de département de laboratoire uh, in the in the uh, Catholic University in Louvain. Then uh, Aitor Zabalgojeazcoa. Uh, Aitor is uh, I, I did I, I said it. Uh, Aitor, I've, I've, been, I've been rehearsing three weeks uh, for, for this. For this, uh, Aitor. Uh, He's from uh, MSF. He's the chief of emer in the in the emergencies uh, uh, unit. Arrived uh, yesterday from Ukraine, so he will he will be able to, to give us a very fresh perspective. Then uh, Natalie Strup uh, Burgaft from the DNDI, from the COVID response and pandemics preparedness. Uh, she's the director of the COVID response and pandemic preparedness uh, uh, unit. DNDI is the Drugs for Neglected Diseases uh, initiative, and finally. No, sorry, not finally. Uh, Wolf and Philip. Then uh, he's the acting director in the uh, in the uh, in the new institution, European institution, HERA, the Health Emergency Preparedness and Response uh, Authority. And then finally, uh, Martin Andler, member of the European Foundation on Preparedness. Okay, we have assigned very very strict uh, uh, times uh, that uh, for uh, uh, for each of the of the speakers. I'm afraid I I I, I will be a bit a bit strict for this because I think it's interesting that we cover uh, all the issues in both blocks and and we still have the chance uh, for a conversation with the audience. Okay, so let's start in the first place with Jonathan. Jonathan, I believe you are. You are ready. We can see you in the in the back. Okay. Well, uh, may I start? Is it all clear? Yes. We can see the presentation. Please go ahead, Jonathan. Okay. Thank you very much. It's a privilege and a pleasure to join you here today. I'm representing WHO and also my colleague, Dr. Putsi Ahuda, who sends her apologies because she could not be, she wasn't able to join us. Uh, the organizers have asked me to talk about the Sendai Framework for Disaster Risk Reduction, and I will do that from a health perspective. I'll also outline the WHO Health Emergency and Disaster Risk Management Framework and share WHO recommendations for resilient health systems. As the Director General has said, we all want a healthier, safer, fairer world. While I will talk about the Sendai Framework for Disaster Risk Reduction, there are some other very important activities taking place in WHO that I just thought I should mention. Um, the Review Committee on the Functioning of the IHR during the COVID-19 response 
is a, is a significant activity uh, organised by WHO. We also have uh, established an intergovernmental negotiating body, uh, the INB, to ne- facilitate the negotiation of a new international instrument on pandemic prevention, preparedness and response. And that is holding public hearings uh, in, in this phase. And I would encourage everybody who's involved in this particular workshop who has an interest in sharing with the IMB those elements that they consider should be should um, be taken into account in the negotiation of this uh, new international instrument. And you can join those public hearings as per that link. And we also have the World Health Assembly coming up on the 22nd of May. Once again, you can look at the proceedings of the World Health Assembly through the WHO website. That's just a few of the things that are going on. We also have the Universal Health and Preparedness Review and a number of other initiatives in the the wake or the lessons learned from COVID-19. Now, the Sendai framework itself, well, the custodian is the UN Office for Disaster Risk Reduction, and WHO works closely with their headquarters here in Geneva and offices around the world. They have uh, recently released their 2022 Global Assessment Report. Uh, It describes systemic risk, looking at all the connections between hazards, vulnerabilities, capacities, and it also uh, makes the point that risk is being created at a faster rate than risk is being reduced. So once again, the UN Office for Disaster Risk Reduction, and essentially the disaster risk reduction community is very much focused on prevention. And all models and approaches around disaster risk really need to have an emphasis on prevention. The Global Assessment Report also looks to the opportunities uh, that present themselves from the lessons and experience of COVID-19 for transforming risk governance. And, and also to address issues around climate change. These issues will be addressed in greater detail at the Global Platform for Disaster Risk Reduction and the World Reconstruction Conference, which will be held in Bali, Indonesia later this month. Uh, WHO also collaborates with UNDRR on strengthening the integration of biological hazards or disease outbreaks into the national and local disaster risk reduction strategies. And in this case, uh, the UN Sustainable Development Cooperation Frameworks. So this is once again, a a strong uh, message and an effort coming from the UN system to ensure that efforts around disaster risk reduction are also inclusive of biological hazards. Hazard information profiles, there are 302 of these hazard information profiles which were published last year. They provide scientific information on on hazards. Uh, They provide a definition, a description, annotations, references, and these 302 hazards are uh, clustered into eight hazard subtypes, as you can see on this particular screen. And it's intended that these hazard profiles inform the joint work on risk assessments, multi-hazard warning systems, uh, implementation of risk management measures, and monitoring and reporting around different types of hazards, disasters, and risks. So the Sendai framework itself, many of you will know this. Uh, For those of you who don't, it's structured around, uh, it's structured in this way. I draw your attention to the 13 guiding principles, to the four priorities for action and the seven global targets. The four priorities for action are around understanding risk, strengthening risk governance, investing in disaster risk reduction for resilience and enhancing disaster preparedness and building back better through recovery, rehabilitation and reconstruction. There are also seven global targets. And as you can see in the bottom right of the screen, WHO has been working with the UN Office for Disaster Risk Reduction to ensure that the member states of WHO, the Ministries of Health, have a far more active role 
in reporting to the Sendai Framework Monitor. That's because the seven global targets all have very strong health implications. They include reduction of mortality, reduction of the people affected, number of people affected, which include injuries, illness, and other health conditions, reduction of disruption to services, including health services, reduction of damage to health uh, to infrastructure, including health facilities, and a reduction of economic loss. They also point to strengthening local and national uh, strategies for disaster risk reduction, strengthening international cooperation, and increasing access to risk information and early warning systems. The Sendai Framework for Disaster Risk Reduction is really an exemplar of health in all policies because it has 38 references to health within it, up from three in the Hyogo Framework. Member states are took into account the fact that health is not merely a sector, as it had been uh, emphasised before, but really it's a shared outcome to which all sectors, all actors contribute to better health outcomes. Health is also people's health status, immunisation status, nutritional status. Uh, these are also risk factors or risk determinants of vulnerability to uh, emergencies and disasters. So uh, we really wanted to ensure that uh, health was made much more explicit within the Sendo framework, and it has become just that, so that the outcome does uh, make explicit mention of health. And throughout the framework, there are many priority actions which speak to multi-agency and whole of society involvement in reducing health risks and impacts, but also speak to the health sector. So you can see there in terms of transboundary cooperation, reducing epidemic risk, uh, strengthening national health systems, and also um, increasing the capacity of health workers in DRR and support for the implementation of the international health regulation. I think it's important to point out that in the SDG health goal, target 3D, which is the one that really focuses on uh, risks related to emergencies, it uses that risk management language. So it talks about strengthening capacity for risk reduction and management of national and global health risks. So when the Sendai framework was uh, agreed, uh, it joined a number of other frameworks and strategies that WHO had. So our feeling was that really they were, they were focusing on either a particular uh, type of risk or they were focusing on a phase such as preparedness or a function such as emergency operation centers, but we didn't have an overarching framework. So in 2019, WHO published this health emergency and disaster risk management framework, which is essentially uh, pulling together good practice from health system strengthening, from humanitarian action, from disaster risk management, from epidemic preparedness and response. And it's an amalgamation of these capacities or priority areas from the Sendai framework, um, health system building box, and the IHR core capacities. And we have these 10 components of the health emergency and disaster risk management framework. And perhaps it's more important to say that behind each of those components is that or in total, there's some 200 functions that really need to be in place. They form the system that will enable the health risks and impacts of emergencies and disasters from all causes to be uh, reduced. And they range from occupational health and safety to sector and reproductive health services, to safe hospitals, to health promotion, uh, to financing, uh, increasing the capacity of the health workforce, et cetera. So, all of those elements are really important, and it goes to show that health systems are really the foundation of managing risks of emergencies and disasters, and health EDRM protects health systems and communities. So taking the health emergency and disaster risk management framework, countries are now uh, implementing health EDRM in different ways. Uh, they're continuing their work on, on increasing the safety functionality and resilience of healthcare facilities. That's a really important component. It was emphasized during uh, the COVID-19 response. They're doing multi-hazard strategic uh, risk assessments. 
they're looking at how they can strengthen their preparedness across all hazards and risks uh, through national health emergency response planning. And we've established a health emergency and disaster risk management research network, which is strengthening the evidence base for health EDRM. And it's also building the research community to do that research. So we have this new guidance on research methods for health EDRM, and we're rolling that out, strengthening the knowledge hub uh, and building uh, learning programs. The diagram on the right comes from a publication called Everyone's Business, and it emphasizes that there are so many codependencies in society, particularly for the health sector. The health sector is very reliant on what's happening in other sectors to, to deliver health services, whether it be security or whether it be uh, critical infrastructure or education, uh, uh, telecommunications. We really do need to look at this holistically. And all of those sectors are, are also contributing to reducing the health risks and impacts of emergencies and disasters. So that emphasizes that whole of society action that's required. Now, when it comes to uh, recommendations for building resilience of health systems, in uh, I think it was September last year, September. Uh, Last year, WHO uh, released a position paper where it called on leaders and policymakers really to, to, to leverage the response to COVID-19 to strengthen pandemic preparedness and health systems. That it emphasized that we need to continue to invest in essential public health functions and all hazards emergency risk management. It emphasized that primary health care remains the foundation or is, a, is critical for uh, public health, but also for emergency and disaster risk management. It emphasised the need to continue to invest in inst institutional mechanisms in research, innovation and learning, and to con continue to put pre-existing inequities and the, the needs and assets of marginalised and vulnerable populations at the heart of our work. Uh, Jonathan, no, sorry, I, I, I need to ask you to, uh, to, to finish if that is possible. I don't know if... This is the last slide. Okay, very good, thank you. Yep, thank you. Uh, so when we look at all the experience uh, and, and all the impact of emergencies and disasters, uh, we come up with these principles. And these principles can inform our approach to um, reducing the risks and impacts of emergencies for a healthier, safer, and fairer world. So if we have very positive responses to these questions, then they provide the foundation for that, those aspirations. Are our policies, planning, and action risk-informed? Are we addressing prevention and recovery adequately, not just preparedness and response? Are capacities being developed systemic and generic capacities and also specific capacities, and are they being applied? How well do our governance mechanisms bring all of those actors together, bring them all together to enable joint decision-making, planning, and action? Are all our health programs contributing to health EDRM using a risk-based approach? Are the subpopulations, are their assets and needs being identified? Are they in the lead in decisions around uh, the design and delivery of services that affect them? And are they given priority for risk management actions? And finally, is equity, equality, accountability, transparency, and trust at the heart of our right space action? Positive responses to all of those will ensure we have a healthier, safer, and fairer world. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Jonathan. Really interesting. Uh, I don't know if there is any burning specific question for uh, Jonathan before we move to the next speaker. Uh, Caroline, please. Uh, you're just, a, just a second, I need to give you a micro. My micro in, in particular. Uh, no, ah, okay. No, it's my, my micro. Thanks very much, Jonathan, for that presentation. I'd like to ask you on what your impression is about the local um, uptake of the Sendai and um, the WHO framework, whether you think that this is getting down um, to local levels, specifically at city levels, where we know a lot of the disasters happen and then need the response. And if you don't think that they are, what do you think the mechanisms are needed to, to have greater uptake? 
specifically within like urban planning and systems planning at the city level, maybe even outside the health sector. Thank you. Jonathan, you, you may answer now uh, because the, we are going to take only one question. Okay. Uh, well, we are involved with UNDRR on the city's resilience scorecard. That's one mechanism where we're trying to apply uh, these um, key messages about managing health risks within the context of um, city resilience. I, I think we've still got some work to do, of course, in, in operationalizing the health emergency and disaster risk management framework. But I think it's, it's more about um, getting the mindset around a risk management approach. I think in the um, local governments, uh, we, we see that uh, there's a lot of work that's going on around cities resilience and uh, public health needs to be very much um, integrated with that. We have some WHO uh, activities around urban health emergency preparedness. That's trying to spread the message around preparedness and response and prevention for infectious diseases. Uh, but I'm, I'm sure that there are many ways in which we can continue to improve that collaboration. There's, there's no doubt that uh, coming out of the COVID-19 experience has only re reinforced the role that local government community actors play. And in fact, you know, when we look at the um, health emergency and disaster risk management framework, we need to be really looking at it from a bottom-up perspective. And WHO is doing a lot more work when it comes to uh, understanding um, the infodemic and uh, addressing issues around behavioural change and risk communication and so forth. And that will once again reinforce that connection. The other important issue is linking the work on, on health emergency and disaster risk management to the local health workforce and to recognise the fundamental contribution that the local health workforce is making um, to reducing vulnerability, to preventing hazards and to ensuring that there is capacity in place, mobilising um, the communities when emergencies occur and also providing intelligence as to who, who is and who is not uh, most vulnerable or what networks and capacities exist within that uh, particular community. So I think that's a, a vital step that we need to um, Thank for, for your response. Thank you so much. So let me move to the next speaker, uh, uh, who is David Lawrence from the, from the Global Fund. Please, uh, David, you have uh, 12 minutes. 12 minutes. Advance my own slides or do I ask for them to be advanced? Your slides? Uh, yeah. I, 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 they, they should be up now. To advance them, do I? Ah, to advance it. Uh, Is there a clicker? Yes. Uh, <coughs> ah, here we go. Not seeing it on the back, but I'll go ahead. Yeah, cool. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, oh, it is on. Maybe I need to move the microphone. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Great. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, it's great to be here. I have to say, on a personal note, it's my first post COVID in person event, and it's uh, really fun. Fun to be back meeting people in person. Um, I also want to give a, a Thanks to IS Global for the invitation to this really important workshop, um, and also a note of appreciation to the historic uh, and strong partnership between Spain and the Global Fund, which has been predicated on a, a mutual understanding that health systems and equity are at the heart of any successful global health strategy. So I'm going to be talking, um, as other uh, panelists have and will be, on our learnings from COVID-19 first and foremost, and then turn to our, our past and current financing of health systems and pandemic preparedness. And th we'll then close with more of a forward leaning, uh, some reflections on um, how our organizational model has comparative advantages that position us well for um, potential future and expanded roles. So um, COVID-19, it's affected all of us individually, the organizations we work for, the programs and the people that we support. Um, with, with every uh, new variant, with every surge, um, there have been disruptions of services, uh, directions of redirections of resources, uh, and health systems overwhelmed. And these have had uh, terrible 
effects on uh, the HIV, TB, and malaria programs that we've been supporting for the past 20 years. Those are implications that we're still grappling with. This is a slide showing uh, information about public health and social measures in response to uh, COVID epidemics in Latin American and Caribbean countries that uh, are receiving Global Fund resources um, through end of December uh, or through December of 2021. And we, we keep in mind that beyond the service disruptions, there have been terrible impacts on uh, access to services related to human rights barriers. Um, we've seen uh, iniquities deepen and we've seen gender inequalities worsen. And I'm gonna move on now. It's not all bad news. Um, we, we've also seen some wonderful examples of resiliency and uh, programs and, and countries that have adapted rapidly to mitigate um, and even to thrive. This is an example from Nigeria that shows K TB case notification, tuberculosis case notification rates going back well before the pandemic, um, right up through 2021. And, and there's been this remarkable uh, increase, acceleration in TB case notification even during the pandemic. And the reasons for, for that success um, are, of course, many. Um, there are several interventions featured here on the left, and, and just to call out the community systems uh, interventions, which have been a key part of this success story. Um, it, it's really an illustration of the need to uh, uh, further strengthen uh, community systems for health um, and, and to integrate those systems within national health systems more broadly. And it, and it reminds us that um, some of these resources that are supporting HIV, TB, and malaria programs and other disease programs are also the very same resources that are needed uh, in responding to, to pandemics. On the right side, these various uh, integrated approaches that um, uh, were seen in Nigeria, uh, they're also um, important in, in giving us insights into the sort of investments that we can be making that provide, if you will, the advantages of marginal costs. Um, where uh, by investing, again, on top of infrastructure in, within institutions and, um, it, you know, with the same uh, human resources, we can, uh, we can achieve uh, cost effectiveness, uh, th th their practical uh, approaches that also have potential political benefits and, and sustainability. And specifically where we're talking about, um, we're talking about focusing on uh, the immediate priorities of low and middle income countries uh, and not, not uh, and, and balancing that, if you will, against um, what are perceived as sometimes theoretical concerns of, of wealthy countries. This is a slide that captures the, the scope uh, and the, uh, and, and sort of the depth of uh, Global Fund's COVID-19 response mechanism during 2020 and 2021. Um, we've seen over um, due to the, the generous support from a number of donor countries, seen over $5 billion uh, invested. Uh, this is on top of our roughly $4 billion per year uh, core financing. And, and that, that financing has been directed towards the, the three objectives highlighted in yellow at the bottom of the slide. Now, when we look at that through um, a somewhat different filter, we look at this here um, limited to 2021, but focusing on the WHO operational response pillars. Again, we see that the, the same uh, systems, the same infrastructure, the same human resources uh, that uh, are the basis for responding to new threats are the ones that uh, we're, we're requiring every day to respond to existing diseases. In fact, the story um, that I'm sure many of you are familiar with is one that many low and middle income countries um, really built on HIV, in particular TB and malaria platforms in order to respond to COVID. Um, this is a snapshot of our 2023 to 2028 uh, strategy framework and highlighted in red, you see this new evolving objective of uh, um, contributing to pandemic preparedness and response. Uh, and here, um, and, and later this year, we'll, we'll have our seventh replenishment. Uh, 
here in the lower left, you see the investment case. Our, invest, our replenishment effort is um, the most ambitious to date. It's um, aiming to mobilize uh, $18 billion. Each of those circles in the lower left is a, is a billion dollars. And an unprecedented uh, level of financing is sought um, for health systems and, and also for pandemic preparedness. Those are the circles there in the, um, in the light blue uh, uh, to the to the right of the dots. Um, this rep represents roughly a doubling of the investments that we're making in health systems. And as you would hope uh, and expect, this will require uh, an absolutely upgraded execution plan uh, in order to match the ambitions that are set forth in that strategy. Um, these are some data that go back to uh, the prior allocation period. Um, uh, take us through the current allocation period in the middle that includes the C19RM financing in red, and then this, the notional uh, and aspirational um, financing in green in the next allocation period. And, and overall, we've seen increasing trends in our financing to health systems, and this includes laboratory systems, diagnostics, surveillance, workforce, supply chain, and a number of other systems that, again, are quite fundamental to the uh, pandemic preparedness and response enterprise. Here, looking a little bit more closely on, on two specific areas, um, community health workers and lab system strengthening in particular are viewed as critical financing uh, growth areas. And this takes into account, again, the, the COVID resources, particularly in the lab side in red. Um, again, these, these are uh, assets. These these are smart for our investments in HIV, TB, and malaria programs and responses, and these make great sense because they're fundamental to uh, country efforts to prevent, detect, and respond to new outbreaks. Uh, these are these are uh, th this graph is looking at um, C nineteen RM investments um, that are specific to health systems, and we've taken a, a somewhat broad definition here, uh, but in, in a very deliberate way where you'll see on the, on the far left, um, the, the case management pillar where we've invested um, quite substantially in historically unprecedented ways in respiratory care and medical oxygen under case management. Um, and a number of other uh, important health systems domains, the ones featured here, but I'll call out the, uh, that acronym there that you uh, don't understand is CSS or community system strengthening. There've been a number of investments um, in uh, health systems uh, that have been mediated through the, uh, the COVID financing that have helped to uh, round out waste management is another one that is, we've seen to be kind of historically underfunded that um, we've seen kind of a uh, increased emphasis on in the COVID response. Um, this slide highlights the fact that uh, Global Fund is the largest multilateral um, uh, investor uh, uh, in grants for health systems. Um, now, grants as distinct from loans, uh, and this, this includes both multilateral and uh, bilateral sources. Um, generally, um, you know, whether at country level or globally, um, you know, our, our grant financing is viewed as complementary to these other sources, um, is typically planned in, a, in an aligned manner at country level. Um, Moving a little bit further in down this pathway, the one minute. Okay, great. Um, so this was a, a review that was commissioned by Global Funds Board last year, um, looking at our, uh, if you will, our positioning and pandemic preparedness. And they highlighted these four attributes, speed, adaptability, um, uh, stakeholder inclusiveness, and uh, new partnerships exemplified by the ACT Day work uh, over the past two years that make us well-suited to, um, to increase our role in the space. Um, this is an analysis published in The Lancet last year by Georgetown colleagues, um, Georgetown University colleagues, which estimated that roughly a third of our financing can be mapped to specific joint external evaluation um, domains and indicators. Um, a, a, a kind of a related costing, global costing by Georgetown, um, uh, looking at five-year uh, financing needs um, and, and estimating roughly five billion in needs per year. And then when we look at that through a global fund filter in the 130 global fund eligible countries, roughly 80% of those resource needs are in global fund eligible countries. Um, 
the, these frameworks have been spoken to. They're fit for purpose for uh, global fund, um, uh, you know, resources and, and and efforts at country level in the same way that WHO frameworks for HIV, TB, and malaria are. Um, account measurement and accountability. Last slide here, and um, also useful uh, in terms of oper operationalization and determining year-to-year -year, um, prioritizations based on these very granular. Um, uh, uh, you know, gaps and, uh, and, and priorities that can be addressed um, through country-led processes. That is all. Thank you very much. Over. Thank you so much, uh, David. Really interesting. Um, any question, any specific question for David uh, before we move? Okay, so we, we can we can leave the questions for the for the end later. So now I'm going to jump to uh, Amieke from Egrin. Uh, Amieke, I don't know if you are if you are ready. Are you hearing me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. We we are hearing you. Okay, so I shared my screen. Are you seeing my screen? Yes, we can we can see it now. You have ten minutes, uh, Amieke. Please go okay. ahead. I'm I'm starting. So um, during the consultation phase uh, of Hira, the Egrin together with Leru, they formed a joint vision and they shared this joint vision, and this resulted in this uh, publication uh, in Lancet, Hira, a new era for health emergency preparedness in Europe. The proposal uh, explained in this uh, paper is a five-pronged bundled model for health uh, emergency. Uh, the first uh, pillar is technological innovation and rapid response to market and regulatory challenges. Uh, elements like uh, stockpiling and distribution, uh, distribution mechanisms of key response commodities, development of technology and identification of solutions to overcome market and regulatory challenges, facilitation of equitable global access of commodities by removing or addressing existing barriers and promoting transparency in their procurement and costs, continuous monitoring of available stocks and rapid detection of and solution to market blockages for needed supplies, which uh, of course will need strong uh, marketing uh, intelligence. Now, the second pillar is harmonization of policy development and adaptable policy implementation at national and subnational levels. So pursue of common, homogeneous and flexible policy formulation and implementation, engagement in a close collaboration with EU agencies like ECDC and EMA, non-EU stakeholders, WHO, Africa CDC, US CDC, Establishment of coordinated stockpiling rules and joint operational procedures. Development of consistent tools for timely adaptive risk communication to general public on risk and mitigation strategies. Creation of an accountability framework with clear description of responsibilities and focal points. Now the third pillar is monitoring preparedness and response mechanisms, adherence to established WHO recommendations um, for uh, 2005 uh, IHR self-assessment and regular joint external evaluation, implementation of the disaster risk reduction Sendai framework, which we just uh, heard about, a strong coordination with other EU agencies and close links with public health institute networks is highly recommended. Then the fourth pillar is horizon scanning to adequately adequately detect cross-border threats and hazards in Europe or elsewhere, and to monitor and evaluate new countermeasures, products, devices, and technologies. This means strengthening and establishing a robust and accessible joint EU and WHO surveillance system managed together with ECDC and monitoring framework to gain knowledge and assess effectiveness of countermeasure products, devices, and technologies. So both will require, require strong political commitment and engagement with other agencies and global initiatives for pandemic preparedness, such as the pandemic treaty. Then the, five, the fifth pillar, and I think this one 
uh, is a very important pillar is education and training with a contribution of academic and public health institutions offering cross-disciplinary didactic plans. Um, this would include implementation of training activities for both health and non-health staff, focusing on augmented surveillance and preparedness monitoring, cost-effective policy evaluation, intensified and coordinated biopharmaceutical R&D, and to promote exchange programs like the Erasmus Plus programs at the, in, in Europe to enable sharing of knowledge and skills useful for preparedness and response plans. Now, there are uh, two cross-cutting elements uh, which relate to promotion of research and innovation for preparedness agenda, especially biopharmaceutical research, innovations in surveillance, advanced forecasting tools utilizing AI and big data, risk benefit assessment methods of outbreaks and monitoring interventions, operational research to pilot uh, interventions, and fostering of international partnership and multilateral collaboration with EU and non-EU agencies and non-EU countries, including low and middle income countries with other stakeholders like NGOs, civil societies, uh, universities, and uh, strengthen WHO as a global supranational moderator. And so the implementation of all components uh, and cross-cutting elements that I just uh, uh, explained here should be the condition to benefit uh, from uh, stockpiling. And in addition to the views, the joint views of Egrin and uh, Leru, I would like to uh, uh, tell a little bit about a project that we have been running at the Institute for the Future, where we actually in uh, February 2020 decided to observe, learn, and try to implement uh, lessons learned. So we work using a transdisciplinary framework and uh, uh, an iterative framework. And the first in the first iteration, we started with uh, what I call a professional team, uh, academics from many disciplines, including medicine, uh, law, uh, economy, anthropology, psychology, uh, sociology, uh, philosophy. Uh, including also stakeholders uh, like uh, uh, politicians, media, uh, social media uh, uh, experts, uh, entrepreneurs, uh, pharmaceutical companies, um, and we actually included uh, students as uh, stakeholders. So with a relatively small team from the start, we worked together to try to frame what is it that we want to do during this pandemic, what can we learn, uh, and we decided to observe, observe what's going on, what went well, what went wrong. And so we ended up listing a number of gaps uh, and uh, investigating these gaps deeper, what are the deeper causes of these gaps, working together with societal stakeholders, so uh, in co-creation workshops, so these were like uh, policemen, uh, firemen, uh, uh, cashiers from supermarkets, um, uh, other students, uh, politicians, uh, other entrepreneurs. So really the broad uh, 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 society to see uh, what did they think of the gaps that we uh, identified and what did they think of the deeper causes and were there anything, any gaps missing? And together we then, uh, try to imagine uh, the future of pandemic preparedness. And it seemed that in this first iteration that we, we were focusing on more societal resilience. Then we did the second iteration and we had a student team also helping us where we tried to figure out how can we bring resilience into pandemic preparedness. Uh, so we tried uh, to uh, to address all the dimensions of resilience, but that was too broad. So then we ended up focusing on learning, uh, linking the gaps and the core issues to resilience ended up with 27 lessons learned, which we sent to the government. So this is uh, an, an effort that we did in Belgium. 
uh, which we sent to the government and the government uh, included this in their, in their report. So we envisioned a learning community as output uh, and in this uh, second iteration. So then we continued, how can we consolidate and implement learnings? Uh, we had again uh, another student team working with us. Uh, then we thought about how can we link lessons uh, to action so that these lessons don't end up in drawers, that actually things are being done. That's where we ended up uh, actually investigating the sustainable development goals and to see, can we add lessons to the sustainable development goals? Do we have to create an additional sustainable development goals? But in the end, we, we, we thought that uh, there were, these lessons could be summarized in seven main uh, themes, which we called the seven pandemic preparedness goals. So then the, the vision for the future is then how do you co-create these pandemic preparedness goals uh, with a learning community? And so we ended up with seven uh, pandemic preparedness goals, uh, two with regard to the pathogen and health. The first is the very obvious one, how to uh, prepare to limit the spread of a pathogen. And there you see the, the usual things like surveillance, con uh, preparing containment and mitigation strategies, uh, thinking about non-pharmaceutical interventions ahead of a pandemic, uh, rapid development of diagnostics, therapeutics, and uh, vaccines. Now, the second pandemic preparedness goal was about health. And what we had seen, uh, especially in the gaps and especially with elderly in need of care, was the lack of uh, social uh, consideration for these elderly. And uh, WHO already has this, uh, the body, the mind, and the social aspects in their, uh, in their focus. But we thought we saw that uh, the even though mind, the mental health is now increasingly being considered, the social relations are still not sufficiently uh, considered. So we suggest to strengthen prevention strategies, optimize search capacity, improve health literacy, protect the most vulnerable groups, integrate mental health into healthcare, integrate care for social relations into healthcare, set up a reflection board to evaluate cost and benefit to the integrated health of implemented measures. Then hey, we have- Amieke, sorry, I, I, need, I need to ask you to, to, to finish because uh, so, uh, yeah. if you can wrap up, thank you. Thank you. Yes. So we had three goals uh, uh, related to governance and society, equip the governments to meet a pandemic challenge, prepare to maintain societal values during a pandemic, and prepare to maintain societal functions during a pandemic. Uh, also, what has also been said here is improve uh, prof and professionalize crisis communication and equip society with creative and adaptive capacity through learning and education. And the fourth iteration is currently ongoing. And there uh, we are focusing on how to uh, co-create, uh, how to do co uh, the co-creation process of pandemic preparedness with uh, societal communities. So thank you. Thank you so much, Amiga. Thank you very much. Amieke, I know that you have to run at four, uh, yes, so yes. so no problem. I, I think that you can join us later, so we can we can I come back later. come back to the yeah. questions. Yeah, thank you very much. Juan, eh, eh, un mensaje por favor para los técnicos. Si si me pueden no apagar el micrófono entre entre porque porque así puedo intervenir cuando cuando. Sorry, it was uh, I was uh, it was in Spanish. I was thanking the, techni the technical team for their <laughs> fantastic work and. And yeah, sorry. Yeah, I, I used so thank you very much. And let's move uh, back to uh, conflicts this morning. We had a fantastic conversation about uh, uh, about this. And Aitor, uh, uh, you have now the the floor, uh, eight minutes. So thank you very much. I need my presentation because if not, I'm I'm lost. Uh, first, uh, thank you for the invitation. We are happy to be here and to contribute. As I, I saw in the in the program, uh, there is much, much, uh, much more people better prepared to speak about uh, 
uh, risk reduction and preparedness, etc. So um, I'm going to try to put the added value of a, a medical humanitarian action uh, actor in the in the in the in the table in the room uh, by uh, narrowing the issue to one uh, to one issue, which is the trauma care during conflict. Uh, this is why uh, we get um, recently a review uh, about what we did in um, in Iraq and in Syria in the last uh, years. So what was our contribution uh, specifically in, in, in Mosul, uh, Aleppo, and Raqqa? And um, we, we were, we, we got some, some, uh, some lessons learned and some new ideas that uh, we think also that they can have some impact in the, in the overview of, of how uh, you know, we can be prepared for a conflict, and not only for conflict, also for, for other disasters. So uh, from, uh, from Iraq and, and Syria, they are very specific uh, on, on, on medical practice, but uh, we get the, the lessons that uh, we, we needed to improve coordination, and especially, especially that parallel systems, which, by the way, we are very used to, to do it, uh, they are not tend to split resources and to and, and the, the the results and uh, you know the they are, they are worse outcomes you know when when you are trying to split and getting out from the system so uh, we, we, I think that uh, you know improving coordination and acting as a system is is a is a key key lesson the second was uh, around medicalizing uh, properly uh, transportation the third one was about focusing on stabilization and resuscitation and not in in far away uh, how is uh, surgery. And the, and the fourth one was uh, about uh, uh, um, you know, fastest transport. Uh, the critical elements that we got in, in this uh, trauma response, uh, um, they were that one which we knew, but now is much more confirmed again, that it is that community-based response in the sense that first responders and, uh, and first aiders are the critical element. So, uh, and the simple and non-technical intervention are key and critical in order to, to, uh, to um, rescue people. Uh, and this is the, the first element which is completely different from a system that we tried to replicate for years and it didn't work, which was the military uh, evacuation and the milita military military uh, trauma system. It was being, in a way, being transplanted to uh, civilian uh, situations and it was not working. And few of those things are uh, ba basically so related to the fact that people who was, who was there, he was not prepared to take care of the people who is uh, getting injured or who gets traumatized. So uh, the second one is that uh, um, um, we, we want to create or we want to force on um, trauma stabilization points, which are uh, an element which has a, a differentiation with other, with other, let's say, kind of um, of uh, care in the in the in the chain, um, and it's a close point uh, which uh, it can provide triage, triage and, and non-surgical stabilization. Then the surgical treatment facilities that, of course, they are they are in the middle, they are the core of the system, and uh, but basically being sure that they shouldn't be uh, uh, too close to the to the. To the um, to the place where the events are happening, because if not, it's not working properly. So we have we got this uh, this um, how is lesson in in the three places in in Mosul, in Raqqa, and in Aleppo, where we were too close to the places to be so try, trying to be effective, but at, 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 at the end we were losing a lot of uh, uh, you know capacity to to intervene because we were evacuating, we were not able to. We were not able to intervene, et cetera, et cetera. So, uh, in, and in order to have adequate resources, human resources, to, stay, to, to have a, you know, a, a good infrastructure, to have a, a good supply lines, you need to be a little bit farther. So this element of the trauma stabilization points are, are a critical issue that we are seeing now as, 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 as a main element in the trauma response. And then, yeah, other things that are very obvious, but uh, occasionally we didn't pay so much attention, like the rehabilitation, like focus on resuscitation and, and the prevention of secondary and, mor and mortality and, and morbidity. So um, some issues also uh, on, on trauma care and, and EMTs, the, the idea of WHO of emergency medical teams and the certified uh, medical teams that now they are also working in conflict situations since, uh, since Iraq, not only, not only in, uh, in, the, in natural disasters, so, uh, you know, fitting again, uh, fitting in the wider system, so getting into the, the, the system, um, greater emphasis in stabilization points, 
um, mobility uh, and transport is, a, is, is one of the weakest points and is a, one of the most difficult to be solved. Um, emergency rooms occasionally are, and very frequently they are not uh, set up for triage the contamination uh, elements that they need to be, do, be done pre pre hospitality for pre hospitality care and it's very important to adapt that to to the the, the facilities to this this kind of needs and then uh, you know the issues that uh, emergency medical teams are a very new idea which are uh, now still to be uh, to be seen how they can be properly coordinated how they co co properly uh, the sustain, etc. Yeah. And uh, then just um, mentioning, like like a wrap up, um, we we continue struggling with uh, with the respect and the implementation of the international humanitarian law respect to the medical mission. So it's an it's an issue that is not solved, but uh, uh, more and more has a political importance because if these laws are not being respected, then uh, humanity cannot be transferred to uh, to and cannot be. Uh, you know, so implemented in, in, in conflict situations. Then uh, I mentioned too that the, the, uh, the capaci capacity of uh, being, being flexible, adapting, and this is very much related also with what happened in the COVID. We saw uh, a lot of rigidity, a lot of, uh, a lot of lack of capacity of flexibility, a lot of a lack of adaptation of, of, the, of the structures and of the teams to, to the new situation. And uh, uh, with all the respect, it was, it was a, occasionally it was a joke in some places, but in the beginning, in the COVID, when we were trying to help here in, in uh, uh, care homes and in, uh, in uh, what we call residencias and in, in hospitals, occasionally people were telling us, this is not Africa. And after two, after two weeks, they were saying, yes, this is Africa. You understand what is Africa? Africa is last. It's not, it's not that you don't know how to do the things or, no, or you don't know uh, what to do, but the lack of resources, the lack of capacity, and, and the, the, all the society, society completely overwhelmed by, by, an issue, by one issue. And then um, the third issue will be that we, we think that we need to continue permanently challenge the political, societal, societal uh, and economic interests uh, that they are interfering in the humanitarian efforts. Uh, and I would speak that we have spent months and months and months trying to convince Syrians that uh, how is uh, women and children care, it was as important as trauma in, in the war and they realized too late. And then uh, for the time that because all the society was uh, focused in the trauma and, and nobody else was you know, trying to focus in, in, a, in, in a, mm, <laughs> let's say, bigger part of the, of the society. So it took, it took ages to convince, and, uh, and we are afraid that this is also happening now in Ukraine, where uh, a, you know, a lot of efforts are addressed to, to, the, to the conflict situation, and, the, and uh, there is a lot of divestment around, uh, you know, uh, other points of, of medical care, like uh, you know, uh, mother and child, preventive uh, care, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, fourth point that is not rather about uh, um, that um, innovation um, uh, needs to be always uh, how is uh, present in these kind of environments because there are new situations, so you need to to uh, to invent things on on the on the on the run. So, um, for example, um, we are trying now to discharge. Uh, in, uh, wounded people from uh, frontline uh, uh, structures and taking them to, to other places. So we are uh, using trains in, uh, in, uh, in Ukraine to evacuate people. We already evacuated around 500 people by this, by this system. And, uh, and as this, uh, there are a lot of things that they can be applied, lessons learned from the COVID, like home-based care, et cetera, et cetera. They can be also applied in, in conflict situations. And, uh, and then uh, just the last point that, um, uh, very frequently or too frequently, institutions and governments they try to go uh, very quickly to the to the um, um, how I can say it to to, to solutions like uh, I, I don't know you heard about the triple nexus and, so, and solutions that are related to to uh, making sure that the chain of, of of risk goes very quickly to uh, to uh, to how is to response and to and to resilience etc etc. But occasionally it's not possible and it's not possible and this needs to be understand that uh, when when aid and only effort of aid it needs to be uh, you know the, the, the society needs to and, and the community needs to focus on that then it needs to focus on that and not thinking on not thinking all the time in the future but also in the, in the present. Thank you. Thank you. Ito. Thank you. <laughs> I've, I've noticed that if I sit very close to the, to the speaker and I look at them uh, 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 ominously, uh, it, it works. Uh, is there any question, any, any question for Aitor specifically now? Uh, Jimena, please. 
go ahead. Uh, there must be a micro uh, there. I don't know if you can tell us a little more about the psychological first aid that you implement in MSF on the general mental health strategy. Yeah, uh, indeed, uh, for the moment, uh, the, if we, we, we could talk now exactly about Ukrainian, Ukrainian situation, uh, the three elements that we are having an added value is first, evacuation of wounded people, second, the supply of very specific issues that they are not uh, present in the in the medical teams and the structures because it's the country is well supplied by the WHO by the by the Ministry of Health etc. and they have teams and the fourth one is that our main activity now is uh, first uh, first aid in, in mental health and and uh, and uh, trying to to expand as much as possible the mental health programs. Yeah. How does it work? Can you give us more about um, <laughs> Basically, first training, first training um, uh, people who know a little bit. The, the problem in Ukraine is that they are not psychologists in general. They are psycho. The, the, the line of psychology in, in the university is psychoeducation. It's not psycho, uh, clinical psychology, so it's it's a little bit. Uh, so training training people who is not fully uh, you know fully on that, but they, they have some some uh, some capacities. Um, um, first aid, uh, first aid, uh, how is uh, psychological support and then uh, trying to expand that to uh, community workers or focal points you know so uh, so you train these people and this train they are start to train and they are very basic very basic issues where they can try to uh, um, help people or um, calm down the people and also identify the most uh, the most difficult cases so they can be referred very basically thank you very much uh, I thought so we are going to move uh, Natalie uh, to uh, Natalie DNDI. I think that your you, this is your presentation. Uh, okay, excellent. Thank you. Yeah. 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 Now maybe it's better. Yes. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, no, thank you very much for this uh, opportunity to present Panther to you. Uh, it's, I think it's the first time we're, we're presenting a bit in a, in a public space, so very happy. Uh, it's still under preparation, you'll see. We started this project um, quite uh, recently. The, the objective is it's to have a pandemic preparedness platform uh, for health and emerging infections uh, and, and response. And we want to link this with the efforts that are ongoing in Europe. So just, I'll try to be quick. So the first thing I'd like to mention is where do we come from? In fact, um, with IS Global in 2020, a few of us were wondering what's going to happen if the pandemic, and that was in April, if the pandemic hits the African continent as was predicted, that there would be 10,000 cases uh, you know, per week or per day. Uh, what will happen for if, if the same percentage of patients need to be hospitalized? How will this be managed? And we knew that it would not be manageable. So what we did was to develop a target product profile to try and understand what would be a way to prevent progression in a way upfront that would meet the country uh, systems. In other words, we decided that we would focus on outpatients um, to prevent them from being hospitalized, that we needed to have a treatment that would be oral, that it needed to be affordable so that countries could uh, later pay for it, and a few criteria like this. And then um, we build a consortium um, with uh, 26 uh, institutions, uh, one study, one platform trial, with this objective of preventing a severe progression in, in uh, outpatients, with um, a, a, a governing principles that are very, we hope, very uh, open and collaborative, meaning that in this consortium, we all work together on a, on a backbone of a study, and then each country or slash uh, sponsor may have some differences that are allowing them to work in their own uh, environment and context. However, we have one study, and there are ancillary studies, two of, of which uh, IS Global, in fact, is, is leading, and DNDI is acting as a coordinator of this platform. And you can see the countries as the vertical bars, etc. So once you know the study is still running, 
Uh, we've recruited 1,264 uh, patients, and uh, we felt that it has been a huge effort to build this platform, to build some capacity in some cases, or, or, or work on the existing capacities that all of those partners uh, had uh, with their own uh, collaboration in the countries. We felt it would be a lost opportunity not to continue with this, but at the same time, uh, there is a, a, a rationale for being better prepared. Everybody has been talking about this. We were not prepared as we, had, we would have uh, wanted to be. So uh, I think the need to have a, a better model and a model that brings the uh, low and middle income countries priority to the, uh, at the governing principles, at the governing stage, was also um, not totally there. Uh, we know that there are discussions around the WHO to, on this uh, convention or treaty on pandemic preparedness. We know that EU uh, has set up a HERA to respond and that HERA has shown an interest or has a willingness to have an international collaboration because a pandemic cannot be an isolated European um, project. Uh, Africa CDC has set up also an emergency preparedness and response. So our vision is really to respond and contribute to the control of future uh, emerging uh, epidemics and all pandemics through a system that will be flexible. It will be a flexible clinical research platform to support preparedness and rapid response to emerging infections, diseases, via the development of tools, which probably will be um, essentially treatment and vaccines with a focus on low and middle income countries. Our mission is to have this ready to use platform, which will integrate research capacity in health systems. So I think the way we see this is that health system strengthening will benefit from clinical research uh, strengthening and vice versa. Um, and this needs to be done uh, with a, a strong leadership of the, uh, for now, African uh, leaders. Just very simply, we have divided um, the functions that we will focus on in two buckets. One, which is the most important one, which is preparedness on the left uh, side of the slide, which is the one for which we will need to have sustainable financing. And one of the key points of this is to be prepared, and we list here the activities, I'll speak to this in a minute, but th this also means that there is an understanding and an acceptancy from the funders that there is this inter-crisis period of time, what people sometimes call the peacetime period, where you still have to invest. You don't really know today what will be the investment uh, producing for peacetime, but you know that it's going to be useful. It's just some work to be done to make it the most uh, money efficient way, but in terms of preparedness, it is, in, it, it is essential that we invest uh, in an intelligent way during peacetime, which means today we have to continue our study anti-gov, which is not recruiting patients, but we know that until we are told that the epidemic is over in Africa, we still need to be prepared for the next wave, if a next wave, and it's exactly the same for, for the platform for other emerging diseases. And this morning we heard, so you know, the predictions, we, we all know that this will happen. So we need to understand, have a, be bright in the way we, we, we fund this inter-crisis period. And in fact, when you think of preparedness during inter-crisis, there's a lot that can be done on better understanding of the pathogen, the immunology, the epidemiology. All of this can be done during the inter-crisis. So investment will not be so much at risk. It's just we can't necessarily define today everything that we'll be doing during the inter-crisis period. So the other things we'll have to do is to have standard TPPs or a mechanism to have TPPs if the WHO is not developing those TPPs, is to have ready to use protocol is to have pre-regulatory uh, approval and my colleagues from uh, IS Global know how complicated it has been to have our study a platform trial approved in Africa despite having great mechanisms through ABAREF, not simple. Having clinical trial operation uh, you know, readiness, which means having legal uh, agreements in place, having a lot of these detailed things which if they're not there, we miss, the, we miss it and we We've been lucky, but it could have been worse, but it was not optimal. So I think there's room for, um, for improvement. So all of these activities will require sustained uh, funding. And then, of course, if there is a need, there will be a response activity through the year, uh, the mechanism that we've used with Anticov. So that's, I think, simpler and more standard. 
So this is busy, but it's to explain how we, man you know, how we developed our strategic plan. Looking at the environment, is this is this a project that has, a, you know, has is, is a meaningful project? Are other people doing this? How much can we contribute? How much are we overlapping? How will we work? Who will govern all these things? The scope we've been um, engaging in all of this. We have a, a quite um, strong uh, working group. You have names here. Uh, please take this as a work, uh, work in progress. But just to mention that we are aware, first, we have very solid African leadership here. We want to have uh, a collaboration. We want to link, link our project with uh, the Africa CDC, with AMRO, AMRO, AMA, which is the future uh, African medicine agency. Uh, we also want to be very well connected with the ex other existing um, uh, uh, platforms. And so we've been in touch with Alert, with Pandora. Um, I'll speak maybe if I can of the COVID coalition. Anyway, just to say that we have a, a solid uh, uh, working group and plans. Maybe uh, key important factors is the way we will define priorities will be for public health. So, you know, for emergency, as, as of now, the WHO has uh, developed the R&D blueprint for emergency and preparedness. The, the last version was 2016, so they are updating this. But of course, there is a list of diseases for which there is uh, you know, an agreed uh, priority setting from countries, so we will follow that. But then we know that uh, probably there will be new priorities coming from the members I've, I've listed here on the slide. So that's our, that's our backbone uh, objective. I've mentioned the strong leadership of, of MICs and the, the important model of sustainable funding for peacetime. The fact that we can work with outpatients, I think I heard um, earlier that someone mentioning this, but we, 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 we think you know, epidemics are not happening in hospitals, they're happening in uh, remote places. It's simple, but it's not so simple to do research in, 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 in that space. So for COVID, we've learned a little bit uh, how to do this, and some of us have already had experience in doing this in, for sleeping sickness, for example, or others. So you know, this, this is important. Um, and okay, and then um, the the skill in, in clinical research is is uh, one of our set finished. I can wrap up now. Okay, so tough. <laughs> taking the mic, the mic, taking the microphone. Okay, amazing. you're close to me. Okay, sorry. So okay, this is to explain how we're doing a scientific priorities. Our architecture. I just want maybe justice to say that for this platform to work, and I hope we'll have more debate on this, we will rely on hubs in, in the regions, which will be defined based on their ability to have, of course, the skills that you would need for, for clinical research, et cetera, but also the link with the WHO, the link with their country, uh, the ministries of health, possibly the link to be built with the, uh, what's becoming you know, the, the WHO hubs for epidemiology and surveillance. In other words, Today I learned a lot about other risks. I think those hubs should have an, an ability to connect, the hubs meaning the, the leaders, to connect with whatever's going to happen in the region. So we, we try here to have, some do not like the centers of excellence uh, vocabulary, so, but you know, solid, very solid, robust places that will be able to also have spokes and train them. And then uh, that's for preparedness and, and large pandemics, and then for local diseases like Lassa, they are already or Ebola, they are already well identified. The last thing is the the mobile teams, because of course to reach out in emergency to 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 conduct research, uh, you have to be able to do this. So I'll, I'll stop. I think just to say we are ambitious. We'd like to launch this in uh, end of this year because we think we need to be prepared. So we have to launch this quite quickly. Um, and this is an idea of what we think the, the steering committee, the board, uh, might look like. So um, you can see that it would not be dominated by uh, European leaders, but more by African leaders. So um, to, be, to be continued. And thank you so much for your time. No, thanks. Thanks so much. Really interesting, Natalie. Thank you so much. I, I apologize because I harassed all of you uh, in the. But it's a. I wonder if there is any specific question now because I, I know I have a, qu a question, but but it's actually for some of you, so I will leave it for the for later. But uh, I don't know if uh, if there is any question you 
you want to make right now? Okay, well, very good. So we can move then to uh, Wolfgang Philipp uh, from Hira. Uh, Wolfgang, uh, I believe you are uh, online. Can you say something? I am. Okay, very good, excellent. Your presentation is already, is already here. Perfect. Okay, thank you very much. I try to rush uh, a ah, bit not, to the slide. Yeah, yeah. Go, go ahead. Go ahead. We are, we are. Uh, if everybody. Ah. Okay, please go ahead, Wolfgang. Yeah. Good. Thank you very much uh, for the invitation to present uh, Hera today to you. Um, I will try to concentrate a little bit on what we are actually doing. I think the concept uh, has been described and shown uh, quite uh, uh, widely. Um, basically. Uh, just to give, just to give the background, I mean Hera Hera was uh, created uh, uh, during the pandemic already, um, based on the first lessons learned and on the first shortcomings that were uh, observed uh, in terms of structural, but also in terms of operational uh, response capacities um, that we had in Europe to the pandemic. Uh, so it came uh, uh, with a, descript a description form of commission communication. But there's also uh, there's also an important piece uh, which is a uh, regulation that would give us possibility to have some specific powers in times of crisis in the future uh, to react uh, uh, more quickly and also more focused. Uh, uh, Wolfgang, with... so sorry to interrupt you. Could you expand your uh, your uh, screen? I mean, put it full full screen so we can because there is there is like a yeah. square. Is that better? Not yet, but maybe it's because we haven't seen it. Just if you can just put like the presentation mode, full screen. Yeah. I have uh, put the presentation. I've put the presentation mode now. No, now now we don't see anything. Uh, no, just if you can if if you can go back. Sorry. Uh, it seems that you are sharing a second screen. Could it be that you are working with two screens? Yeah, I'm working with two screens, yeah. So I think you are sharing the screen that should not be shared. <laughs> OK, good. Um, in that case, I mean, is there, wait. If so not, share. maybe we can share it. Yeah, please, please right? upload, yeah. So in the one that we are now seeing in the one that you are having uh, your camera that is being recorded, in that screen is where you should be putting the, the presentation. Okay, one second. That screen. Do you see this? Uh, yes, very uh, well. No. Yeah. <laughs> yes? Well, uh, I yeah, it, it I works. I I I see it in your room on the on the on yeah, the screen. Yeah, there is something in there that I don't know what it is. Can you close that square? Ah, on top, on top, that you see display settings? Now, now, it's perfect. No, but now you have to go back. No, uh, now it's, uh, yeah, now, now, now it's, it's perfect. Good. Go, go ahead, Wolfram, because we are going to, to lose the... Go ahead, please. Okay, anyways, um, so I don't know what you see on the screen there. I mean, this is just the first slide, right? I don't yeah. know, are you directing now the slides or do I should... I mean, uh, what is the, what's the idea? To tell us when to advance. Okay. You you tell us to to advance the 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 presentation. Okay. Okay. Please so, please go on. Next one, please. Next one. To the second to the second one, please. Go go to the fourth. Go to the fourth. Uh, to the to the fourth. Next one, please. Okay. So basically, Hera was Hera was sorry for that uh, for that. A technical hiccup. Um, so basically, Hera was created as one part of the uh, European Health Union package. Uh, it's a tangible, uh, tangible outcome, basically, of the lessons learned, uh, as I mentioned. Um, uh, but it's not uh, an, a, a single standing element. Uh, we also have been working on extension of the mandates uh, of the European Medicines Agency, the extended mandate of the ECDC. Um, and also uh, 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 on the uh, strength and the coordination at EU level uh, to face uh, when facing cross-border health threats. So this is all uh, a, a big uh, legislative package uh, of which HERA is one element, a tangible one. Next one, please. The main mission. Next slide, please.
Thank you. The main mission is uh, relatively uh, focused and um, uh, looking at addressing uh, more, ten, more effectively a serious cross border health threats in all set approach. And the idea is uh, to be able to uh, uh, have medical countermeasures uh, available at scale and at places where they're needed when facing uh, health emergencies. Uh, so HERA is a, an element that contributes obviously also uh, to, to strengthen, to structure, to restructure the global health emergency preparedness and response architecture. The next slide, please. We operate in two modes. Uh, no, not this one, please, the one before. We operate in two modes. Uh, one is the preparedness mode and the other one is the crisis mode. So 99% of the work or more should uh, obviously be uh, in the preparedness mode. And it's a full end-to-end -end solution. That means we start with intelligence gathering and that is intelligence uh, on uh, epidemiological intelligence, but also supply chain uh, intellig intelligence. Uh, through threat assessments, we go down the whole uh, value chain to uh, procurement, stockpiling, and distribution uh, um, of medical countermeasures uh, when they're needed. In crisis mode, uh, we have a couple of uh, uh, particular uh, activities we would focus on that would obviously be on uh, fast procurement uh, and manufacturing, um, first manufacturing and procurement of crisis-relevant medical, medical countermeasures, and we would uh, be able to activate uh, quickly emergency funding uh, to do so. In the crisis mode, we would operate, obviously, at a um, um, at a, uh, a high the highest possible political level to have decisions uh, uh, coordinated uh, at EU level uh, um, in the best and most efficient way. We have uh, a specific governance. So Hera is not an agency; it is an, a normal commission service. And it has uh, several advantages. Um, we were uh, uh, fast in setting it up. Uh, it's an agile structure. We uh, have access to uh, the whole infrastructure and uh, instruments uh, that the commissioner has at its, at, at its end. And we have access, uh, direct access to uh, financing uh, certain activities under HERA. We do this in full, uh, in full complementarity and alignment, obviously, with the member states, which are represented in the HERA board. The HERA board basically is a board uh, that discusses uh, strategic decisions uh, to be taken and also the work plan including strategic strategic work plan um, so all member states are sitting there represented at a high level and uh, we uh, uh, have other boards that support the work of that board at the technical level but also from a civil society and industrial industrial uh, perspective the next slide please The uh, work plan 2022 uh, was obviously something that had to be developed uh, relatively quickly uh, since it was established on the 1st of October last year only. Uh, we have a full budget of 6 billion euros uh, until 2027. Uh, for 2022, we have access to about 1.3 billion. And uh, as I mentioned, we use uh, budgets from the EU for Health, the health program, from the uh, Horizon Europe, the research program, and then for stockpiling uh, uh, measures uh, uh, we have access to uh, the Rescue U uh, budget uh, of the civil protection uh, mechanism. Um, and uh, these are all obviously activities uh, in, motion, in motion. Next slide, please. The, um, so to come, to come a bit more uh, on, the, uh, on what we're actually doing at the moment, um, apart from developing uh, HERA, to become uh, fully operational. So we still work on the implementation of the EU vaccine strategy, uh, just mentioning uh, that, that, that covers the, that covers the uh, implementation of all existing uh, uh, advanced purchase agreements and purchase agreements that the EU has concluded with uh, uh, now, I think, eight different vaccine producers. Uh, so far, we have received um, already 1.6 billion doses across the EU. There's a lot going on uh, in terms of uh, donations as well. Uh, we discuss uh, with the manufacturers, manufacturers the development of uh, adapted vaccines to uh, be able uh, to have always the most effective vaccines uh, available, uh, uh, which are governed under these uh, contracts. So uh, all of this uh, uh, is not just uh, covering uh, the needs uh, in the EU, but at the global level. Next slide, please. Um, because uh, much of it goes into donations. So far, that's about 500 million doses that already have been uh, donated, some of them uh, through bilateral or multilateral 
uh, donations to single countries, uh, but most of it obviously goes uh, through COVAX. At the moment, we are working, uh, we, we are not stopping with the contracts that we have in place, uh, but we follow also uh, recent developments uh, of uh, uh, effective vaccines. So we are working, for example, uh, on a joint procurement uh, for, uh, uh, for a product uh, developed by HIPRA, but uh, we will continue to work uh, on the identification and also procurement of uh, uh, next generation vaccines. Um, we also look into, uh, uh, into ensuring the access to uh, therapeutics, so COVID-19 therapeutics. We are mainly focusing at the moment still on dealing with the current pandemic. Uh, COVID-19 uh, uh, COVID uh, therapeutics are usually uh, procured and at a new level uh, through joint procurements, uh, depending on which member states has which uh, interest in, uh, in, in, in certain of these products. Uh, so far, uh, mainly, uh, mainly monoclonal antibodies or uh, uh, antivirals. So uh, we follow this uh, up with all existing, uh, with all companies that have products either close to uh, uh, regulatory approval or uh, that have products uh, approved. To make sure here again that all countries that uh, want access have equitable access uh, and timely access to these products uh, at the uh, uh, same set of conditions. Next slide, please. Uh, when it comes, uh, I said HERA is an end-to-end -end solution, uh, starting with intelligence gathering and threat assessment. So basically, uh, here as well, we are working uh, uh, on the development uh, of uh, um, the best possible threat anticipation and prioritization uh, uh, of potential uh, um, health threats with, uh, uh, with a uh, epidemic or pandemic uh, potential that is done through, uh, uh, through different areas of work. Um, when it comes to crisis phase, uh, we would uh, switch this mostly into uh, into uh, uh, monitoring uh, um, the availability uh, of crisis relevant medical countermeasures to make sure that uh, the whole value chain uh, is covered uh, to have medical countermeasures available as quickly at, and at, uh, at quality uh, requirements uh, needed uh, as possible. Next slide, please. Uh, so when it comes, for example, to real-time intelligence gathering, that is something we're working on, on platforms uh, um, with uh, also external partners. That's something uh, we do just here in-house. But uh, as I said, it's not just on the epidemic intelligence, but it's also on the supply chain, simply to make sure that MCMs are available uh, at time. And that comes uh, obviously also then with, uh, with uh, trends, observations, modeling and forecasting uh, of potential threats. Uh, to work during the preparedness time, obviously, uh, in these areas uh, by investments uh, into uh, research, by, uh, through procurement, and so on and so forth. The next slide, um, that is just uh, to show a couple of examples on what we are actually working on. Um, so, Final uh, minutes, if, if you may, okay? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah Two more minutes? Two? Yeah. yeah. Okay, so IT platforms, uh, which are under development, uh, we're working on threat uh, prioritization already on the first uh, most prominent threats. We are also uh, investing into, uh, uh, into uh, uh, work on antimicrobial resistance, uh, basically to identify uh, potential compounds that might be of interest uh, uh, um, uh, to cover our needs. Uh, we are working on, uh, um, on strengthening all kind of uh, elements around epidemic surveillance uh, and uh, coming back also to, uh, to structure and to get a strong EU-wide networks for clinical trials uh, established not just in Europe, but also through investments uh, into the EDCTP3. Uh, Many of uh, you might know. Uh, I'm, not, um, I'm not going into details here, but what we have been uh, coming up with is a, uh, is a call for an EU network for uh, manufacturing facilities uh, for vaccines and therapeutics, uh, which uh, is currently open for submission of interest. Uh, and then obviously, as I said, we're not just working alone. We have a lot of international partners. We're working on memorandum of, on, 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 on a multitude of memoranda, and not to have a memorandum of understanding, but to have operational links, and also to uh, work jointly on projects uh, of uh, global interest uh, in terms of better preparedness uh, uh, and response capacities uh, for epidemics uh, and um, uh, pandemics. So um, next step is to uh, go uh, into, uh, into more in-depth discussions uh, with the member states on multi-annual strategic uh, plans for pandemic preparedness and response uh, in Europe uh, with full complementarity and alignment uh, of what is happening in member states. And we will do the, uh, the same 
uh, at global level uh, with international actors uh, um, and uh, um, uh, want really to make sure that uh, we take all the steps necessary to improve the global health security and to ensure that we have at the next pandemic or epidemic, uh, whatever is first, appropriate medical countermeasures or capacities for the uh, production and the, uh, development and production of medical countermeasures uh, at our hands. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, Wolfram, thank you. I believe that those, uh, those uh, following this uh, online, I think is, is working properly. Here uh, in, the, in the room, it, it looks like when my teenage uh, children get the remote control and, and uh, we keep changing from one side to the other. So, uh, Tony, you had a question? Uh, uh, the micro, please. Uh, one question for you, Wolfgang, if, if, uh, if you may. Thank you, Wolfgang. Uh, I'm Tony Placencia from Is Global and also from AGRI, the European Global Health Research Institute's network. Just a specific question. Uh, in the model that you described, and thank you for the updated uh, presentation, in the model that you described, uh, where uh, do you place the interaction with, with science and with knowledge and with scientific networks, uh, right. including uh, the academic networks? Can you uh, delve a little bit more on that in the... Absolutely. No, that's a very important point. Thanks for the question. So basically, that is uh, obviously a very prominent uh, part of the work that we, uh, that we invest into. Uh, as I said at the beginning, uh, we have... There's a certain, there's certain budgets uh, earmarked... Um, uh, for HERA under, under, under different funding instruments, including Horizon Europe. And uh, um, as you know, Horizon Europe, the work, the work programs, they are uh, uh, developed uh, in a co-creational process here at the Commission, uh, also with the input, obviously, of the member states. Uh, what we are doing, uh, and the, the, the main interface here with the science, the scientific community and the academic scientific community is obviously by setting, uh, by setting some of the priorities or by proposing some of the priorities uh, for funding um, when it comes to uh, uh, um, uh, pandemic preparedness um, uh, uh, research. So that is what we are doing. Uh, we set our priorities and we try to get, uh, we try to maintain this obviously in the discussion with the member states uh, in the work plan to have a sufficient amount of, um, of funding available through Horizon Europe for the relevant research in that area. Thank you very much, uh, Wolfgang. So we have, ah, there you are. So we have the final presentation uh, from Martin. Uh, if you may, Martin, uh, you have your eight minutes and uh, you can, it, uh, that's it, thank you. Yeah, okay, so thank you, well, thank you for the invitation. Thank you for ICE Global, Elizabeth Cardis, for inviting me to make this presentation. I'm sort of humbled to be here because I'm not, I'm a mathematician, but I have absolutely no expertise on the topics that have been discussed today. And I can see it uh, very well by the number of acronyms that have been mentioned today and that I don't understand. So I've learned a number and I've forgotten more <clears throat> and of course i'm here uh, to make the this might be a, like a private joke but to bring the three hard-boiled eggs to the marx brothers uh, uh, meeting uh, <clears throat> i'm 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 not sure that everybody knows the uh, night at the opera but <clears throat> so and i'm also humbled because what i'm going to present is an idea and I've been, I, I'm talking after people who've been discussing billions of euros that they're actually uh, controlling and investing in uh, the prevention of environmental and health crisis. Okay, so I'll start with talking about something that's a few centuries, that looks like a few centuries ago. Uh, we, in the spring of 2020, we were faced with uncoordinated responses to the pandemic at the European level. The least affected countries uh, showed very little or no solidarity at all with the worst hit ones, actually with a sort of feeling of superiority. Uh, I'm French and French people always feel superior to everybody else. So they said, yes, of course, Italy, but you know, Italy, not, not us, right? Or China, but not us. So uh, this was really appalling. Italy had to turn to China to get some help. This was 
And we saw also that the EU was completely incapable of coordinating the logistics, uh, the research, uh, there were conflicting initiatives. So since spring of 2020, things have improved quite a bit, really very significantly. And in a way, this gives hope to people like me who are very pro-European, which shows that sometimes Europe can get its act together. <clears throat> so in, in June, faced with the situation in the spring of 2020, a number of scientists, 77 scientists from 17 countries in Europe, uh, published a call, a call for the creation of a European Foundation for the Prevention of Environmental and Health Crisis. So the idea was that faced with the situation where government, national governments, where the European Union was sort of not dealing with the situation well, we thought, well, we have to have a bigger involvement of citizens and among the citizens, they are the wealthy citizens, so that we could create a kind of, say, quote unquote, Gates Foundation at the European level that would be funded by uh, wealthy, wealthy Europeans. Uh, we had the goal of raising, we, have, we still have a goal of raising 20 billion euros coming from a number of wealthy people, but I'll come back to this. So the call was published in June of 2020. It, it had quite a bit of media impact. There was a correspondence published in Nature, a number of articles. I've given a few here. Uh, Le Monde, the uh, Polish newspaper, La Stampa, Frankfurter Allgemeine, a number of... Uh, uh, media reflect, I mean, talked about this initiative. <clears throat> and actually, to be frank, since then, not that much has happened. In the fall of 2021, we published a white paper, a little booklet. Yeah, I, can, I can show it. Uh, it's also online. Yeah. Looks like this. I have a few, not many. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you know, explaining the initiative. And, uh, and we, of course, we've also, you know, been thinking about, you know, what should be done. We did not get a phone call from a billionaire uh, saying that, you know, they're willing to start by giving us 500 million euros and then we'll see. So this, we haven't made much progress in this. Uh, and now in next month, in June, uh, we're organizing a French presidency event. So as you know or don't know, actually, this semester is the French presidency of the EU, so there are a number of labeled events, and it's called in French PFUE, uh, Présidence Française de l'Union Européenne. So we're organizing an event which will take place at the French Academy of Science on uh, June 8 of 2020, which will promote, promote this the event. So of course, all of you who want to would want to attend, but it will be only physical presence will are will be welcome and can can talk to me <clears throat> after this. So this is uh, an idea of the program. So we have uh, three sessions. Well, I will be giving an introduction, and then there will be three sessions. One is from science to action-driven research with a number of, of speakers. Um, and then session two is uh, crisis responses at European level with Elisabeth among, among the speakers. And then the third session will be, you know, what civil society could do. So this will be more a discussion about, you know, what private, private foundations or independent foundations could do. So let me end. So I, I, I think I'll be on time, but I, I can try to extend to, to be scolded a bit. Ast but astonishing, <laughs> astonishing, Martin. Especially you are a hero. You are a urban hero. Yeah, but I'm not quite. I'm not quite done. And ah, okay, you know, okay. I, <laughs> and uh, <clears throat> so now I can start being talkative. And <laughs> uh, so. Our idea, I mean, we certainly, and the people who are at the heart of this initiative, certainly do not think that we should reject public action. We're very much in favor of 
public institutions and the role of public institutions. So the idea is really to complement public institutions by actions which are implemented, which are started, which are controlled by independent institutions and a foundation w could be one of them. There could be other kinds of uh, institutions. Of course, this private foundations, if it, uh, if it uh, exists one day, will definitely have to work with uh, public, with def will definitely have to work with public partners. And possibly, as we have been thinking lately, is that maybe it could be also funded partially by public institutions or by people, citizens who are not billionaires. So I'm going to come with uh, asking for a bit of money from you. Uh, <clears throat> um, so this is, this is definitely our idea, to bring in society into the picture of how we handle with the, with the crisis. I, had, I mean, this morning, especially, where we, we were discussing, well, people were discussing these various issues, the similarity of what was being discussed in the various topics. There was health, environment, nuclear, uh, uh, volcanoes, and in a way, all the talks were the same to some extent. I mean, it, it was really incredible. And this certainly makes me think that if we do create a foundation, a private foundation like this, it probably should have a wider scope than just health and environmental. Uh, the second thing is that, and as we have been thinking, if you look at health issues, usually they are short term. They're in March of 2020, suddenly we were hit by COVID. Most of the crisis in environmental issues will come out very, in a very gradual way. So the way to handle with environmental crisis is not the same as the way to handle with, with health crisis. But so, you know, this project is, is really at this stage an idea. We're really open to any discussion. I mean, obviously what I have seen today is that a lot of the people who would have interesting ideas about discussion are here or online. So thank you very much. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Martin. <laughs> Finally, you, you covered your time. I mean, you made big promises, but you covered your time. Oh, so, so I don't want you to. Uh, yeah, <laughs> no, you didn't go over. No, no. Okay, so um, Elizabeth was suggesting me that maybe we could uh, finish. I, I, we, I, I was thinking that, but we could finish with Sinaya. Sinaya Netanyahu from WHO Europe, so we can close this set of European uh, presentations. And maybe, maybe if we could have a short intervention from Sinaya, and then we, we are going to make a quick uh, stop. Well, I, I, I will open a little bit the conversation, and then we are going to make a, a, a small stop. Since we have the buffer of the, of the last session, uh, the, the, I, I, I am not, I mean, I must apologize to uh, to the people that are waiting to intervene, that we are a bit uh, delayed, but still, I mean, we have we have time within the within the, the agreed time frame. But uh, uh, Sinaya, if if you are, see, are are you there? Can you hear us? For me, and I can see that you see the presentation. Yes, we do. Well, we do in two places, but not in the in the third. When we do is when we when we see it in the three screens, it's jackpots. It, it's happened twice uh, during the day. All right. Um, so, shall I proceed or? No, no, we have it. Okay. Okay. Yeah, go All right. ahead, please. So, so, good afternoon, and I'm, uh, I'm here joining you uh, from, from Bonn, Germany, uh, from the WHO European Center for Environment and Health, which is part of the WHO uh, regional office uh, in, in the European regional office. And what we do here in, in our shop is uh, looking into environment and health. And when we refer to environment and health, I mean, I think that uh, these days it's fair to say that this is not just environmental pollution, but we always refer to the triple crisis that we are experiencing uh, in, in this decade, uh, which is the environmental pollution, climate change, also biodiversity loss. And I always like to add to that the land degradation and deforestation. All of those things, the environmental pollution, climate change, and biodiversity loss are um, affecting health. They're affecting this pandemic in one way or another, and they will affect uh, future pandemics. 
So um, I will also address today and what we are doing in that regard, but also I will take a different angle because our, our unit is not uh, a part of the uh, emergency unit. We are more a technical uh, unit. So we sit, as we said, here in Bonn, we are a center of technical and scientific, ex um, uh, uh, a, a technical and scientific expertise on the impact of uh, the environment on, on health. We were established by um, the ministerial conference on, on environment and health back in eight, 1989 by 53 member states of the European region. We provide member states uh, with state-of-the-art evidence on existing and emerging environmental health risks. We develop policy advice and international guidelines, uh, methods, and also practical tools uh, for our member states so they can work with them and inform better their decision-making uh, processes. We also assist member states in identifying and implementing policies to protect um, and promote health. And we support member states in the implementation of commitment on environment and health. It can be a regional or global uh, commitments. We have five programs in our center, uh, in our unit uh, in Bonn. One uh, that I'm uh, uh, heading is uh, the environment and health impact assessment. We deal with um, environment in, uh, urban, uh, in, in urban settings, uh, inequality, health impact assessment, waste management, nature, um, uh, also uh, contaminated sites, and very recently also we are involved on in the issues related to One Health, which I will explain later. We also have a unit uh, or program that uh, deals with living and working environment, which deals with air quality, chemicals, uh, climate change mitigation, um, and this is very, very critical because, um, as you know, air pollution is probably the number one or the major uh, health, threat, uh, health threatening uh, environmental hazards that we are experiencing globally, but also in the region. Uh, we also have um, a unit uh, program that deals with water and sanitation and hygiene and climate change adaptation. Uh, we have a unit that deals with multi-sectoral partnership and also another unit or program that deals with violence and, and injury. The mandate, we were asked to discuss the mandate that we are having. Our mandate comes from the, the GPW, the General Program of Work that governs the, the WHO globally, and also from the European Program of Work for the region. But the, both of them actually mirroring each other. And they are concentrating on three pillars. One of the healthier population. Um, this is part of our work. We relate our work relates to health and well-being. There is another uh, pillar that deals with emergency, and another pillar which deals with um, uh, health health systems within the European region. The WHO of Europe, um, uh, the emergency division. Uh, which is not part, as I said, Bonn is not part of it. Uh, they deal with building, to build, with building capacities to support countries in preventing or also detecting and responding to a range of health emergencies, as well as to um, risk associated with climate change zoonosis, diseases, and antimicrobial resistance by collecting evidence, uh, lessons, supporting uh, preparedness and re response capacity, but also um, uh, by, by helping member states to produce uh, public goods that required uh, to require uh, to manage cities. We here in Bonn also have our mandate in addition to the, the above uh, two program programs, um, work programs, we also get our mandate from, the, as I said, from the member states. Uh, every several years, we have the ministerial conference uh, from both, uh, that involves both sectors, ministries of the environment and ministries of health. And they basically define for, uh, for the region how they would like us to proceed and focus on the subject also that uh, they would like us to focus and develop in order to support the member states. Last time it was in Austria in 2017, and it was defined in a very silo approach um, directing us to look into water-related issues, chemicals, air pollution, cities, waste management, contaminated sites, and healthcare facilities. Again, we are not dealing with emergencies. We are just um, you know, uh, supporting the countries with the, um, the science, the evidence, the policy, etc. The next ministerial conference will be in Budapest in 2023, 
And it will be very interesting how the member states will guide us in the future, given the pandemic that they're all experiencing and um, affecting them. We also draw our um, uh, framework of work and mandate from the WHO Global Strategy on Health and Environment and Climate Change. We basically um, has uh, six strategic objectives. One is uh, primary prevention, number two, cross-sectoral action, number three, to strengthen the health sector, and number four, build support, number five is to enhance and evidence and communication, and number six is monitoring. All of those relate to uh, environmental areas or sectors and also to climate change. In response to the COVID-19, the headquarters, the WHO headquarters, have published a manifesto um, in relation to health recovery. And um, I think that this is really important uh, when we come to environmental and health, uh, is really to look what are the issues that we need to support member states in, re in, in recovering, how they can integrate environment and health into the recovery process, and how they can build resiliency um, at the national level and at the local level, also obviously regional level in those areas. Number one prescription that was advised that we were advised with was to protect and, pres and preserve the source of human health, which is nature. And this is very impactful, this uh, prescription, this number one prescription also take into account the triple crisis, as I mentioned before, and it addresses environmental pollution, uh, climate change and biodiversity loss. We also specifically looked into provision of uh, basic uh, goods like uh, water, sanitation, energy uh, in general, but also specifically in healthcare facilities, um, ensure quick and health energy transition in order to reduce uh, air pollution, but also to assist with uh, going towards zero carbon, also to promote sustainable food systems and build healthy and livable cities and also stop tax uh, uh, financing uh, polluting activities using taxpayers' money um, much, much better than before. So those are parts of what uh, the manifesto is in recommending in relation to, um, to future uh, recovery. During Sin the pandemic- Sinaya, sorry, I, I, I need you to, to start wrapping up, thank you. Okay, Thank you. so I, I will skip that. I know we'll just go straight. Uh, during the pandemic, we, we, we did several events related to that. I mean, it was really incredible. We also had to discuss with member state issues related to very basic things like water, wash, or the sanitation. And I will jump quickly to this project because I think this is a very interesting project that we did in the line the past year, and we're going to launch it next, uh, next month. It's about protecting the environment and health by building urban resilience projects. We came, um, we came from saying that, okay, the member states, specifically cities have uh, sustainable, they have several commitments to fulfill, like the SDGs, the Paris Agreement, the SENDI uh, framework uh, for disaster risk reduction, and also the new urban agenda. And we wanted basically to see with the help of ICE Global and also with the help of UN Habitat, what is actually happening in the country? What are the evidence on that regard? Are they really building forward better, taking into account those commitments uh, and also trying to be committed to really improve health and environment? We also interviewed cities and we also developed or we present a framework uh, of indicators that can support uh, policy makers in that area. So, um, the event is planned now for the 14th of June. I'm sure ICE Global will announce, uh, will, will disseminate our flyers and uh, to all participants. One last, one last item that I wanted to mention, it goes without saying that these days uh, we must include also into this conversation, the conversation on the one health approach. How can we bring together human health, animals health and environmental health? What we have done recently, and this is another forthcoming product that uh, we have done here in the Bonn office, is we look specifically on the role of the environment in this whole uh, three uh, interconnecting uh, areas. So this is something also to, to be coming up because again, much has been done on human health and animals health in relation to the pandemic. Very little was done in relation to the role of the environment. So we actually formalize that and um, we will advertise this uh, event uh, which will take place sometimes uh, in June. So I'll stop here and thank you so much for inviting us. Thank you.
Thank you very much, uh, Sinaya. So, I have a question for you and for the rest of the presenters, and now we are opening a small, a small time for a, for a conversation. That is, is related to the, to, the, to the impact of COVID in your, in your work, in the ascendancy of your, of your work, and the political ascendancy of your, of your work. I can imagine that COVID has made your work much more complicated, much more difficult, but has it made it more relevant? Do you feel that now there is a political traction that provides an opportunity to do things that maybe before COVID were more complicated, that we are able to convince policymakers and societies of things that before uh, uh, 2020 were more, were more complicated? Uh, so this is my, my first question to open the conversation. And uh, this is, I, I wonder, uh, no, no sé si podemos poner en la pantalla a todos a, a los, a los otros presentadores también que han participado online, eh, si podemos, como, como hicimos antes, por, para que in, intervenga el que quiera. Gracias. Ok, I don't know if any, anyone, any, any of you has a, yeah, Natalie, please go ahead. It's a, it's a great question. I think um, what we have seen that hasn't happened so much, I would say, uh, and that's by with Anticov, but also the coalition that we have uh, sort of built with researchers from LMICs is that their priorities were not totally taken into account at the highest level, I would say, not sufficiently. And, and this means that, you know, the, the, the access to some of the tools was, well, the tools were not necessarily the priorities for the tools were not necessarily uh, um, developed or, or managed for, for all needs and all settings. That's one, I think, and, and we've seen, I think, a shift now. The, the, it seems that the, well, maybe I'm optimistic, but this seems to have changed a bit, the understanding that you have to contextualize everything. The second point is maybe that on the regulatory side, um, I think we've all seen how long things have been in some some places and very quick in others, and there's a need to be more organized and better prepared. And, and that works for, for pandemics, of course, but it would benefit everything else. Uh, so I, sometimes I think the, the emergency has pushed us to do things in a way that was justified because of the emergency, but will be useful for other cases. And you can't, ask the same you know, principles for pandemic for everything, but at least you can learn how to do it. And from that, you can maybe in the future simplify, harmonize, and do better things. Same for harmonization, same for data sharing, same for many things. Thank you. I don't know if any, anyone else wants to say something about this or anybody in the uh, online. Sorry, you, David, please go ahead. Thanks. It's it's too uh, too juicy a question not to respond to, but I, I have to take a a broader view. It's and, and one that's not limited to um, to global fund as you know in our organization. Um, but I, I feel like you know we're all s sensing this this um, kind of uh, sense of in, in, you know guarded optimism optimism versus impending doom, where the cycle of panic and neglect seems. It seems like we're on the cusp of repeating it. We're seeing that already with uh, test and treat and the novel therapeutics that are coming out. Um, we're seeing that with respect to uh, COVAX and, and driving um, progress towards the goal of 70% vaccination in low and middle income countries, particularly in Africa. And, and where are those commitments today? Um, it, they're, they're just, they're up in the air. Um, and, and people, you know, we've, we've got these intervening crises that are uh, um, you know, distracting and drawing resources that are critically important too. Um, there are a lot of existential issues happening at once and uh, it, it's, it, it, it's hard in this moment when I think we, we've pressure tested our readiness with this pandemic. There was um, widespread failure. Um, this is the moment when we would hope to see, I think, greater consensus on the solutions we look at we talked about the pandemic treaty earlier we there's ongoing processes who led around reforming the international health regulations um there are discussions underway about um ensuring that 
WHO has the basic resources to do its job. These, these, aren't, these conversations, unfortunately, don't seem to be any easier today um, than they were before the, before the pandemic. And, and I think one of the, I'll just call out again, we talked a lot about the issue of trust. Um, Anthony raised that this morning. Um, as, as so, you know, one of the key learnings is trust, community engagement. Um, and in, in so many places, it, we're moving in the, op we had a lot of lunchtime conversations that kind of fed these sentiments, but we, we're moving in the opposite direction. And, and then we come back to, we, we want to focus on these preparedness frameworks. How do we, how do we strengthen and improve readiness um, when these are the fundamental things, bringing that d the divide between preparedness and, re and response. Um, and, and I just, you know, I think it's, it's very sobering. Um, I, there is, you know, I, I was hoping to end this with a little bit more of a, a positive, but, but, I, I, but I think we have to be sober-minded about, about this and, and not too, too Pollyannish, because um, the, uh, you know, there's still this massive challenges ahead. So anyway, that, that, was, uh, that was more of a, again, not, not an organizational perspective, but more of a, no, I, a personal one. I, I think one. That, that's very fair, uh, absolutely. I don't know if anybody online, you, you just have to raise your hands. Uh, uh, Sinaya, please go ahead. Yeah, I think that uh, one thing is really in, very interesting to see is that, um, you know, the, the, the silo approach that has to be, be, be broken. Uh, and I think that more, more and more people realize that in research, and, but also in, in uh, sectorial uh, engagement in uh, government and the way governments work. So we do see more, you know, the, 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 there, is, there must be more openness. And, um, and I think that we do, we do see that. The question is, how do we maintain this? Um, another thing is that I think this uh, COVID also taught us that um, very basic things that we thought that we forgot about them that related to non-communicable diseases, mostly like wash, water, and sanitation, suddenly they become an issue in certain countries, and this should not be taken into uh, taken for granted. But, you know, issues related to soap, hygiene, and stuff like that. So we came back to that. But also many countries, uh, many, many countries were coming back with questions of, uh, okay, how is air pollution is affecting? Uh, what is the inequality issues related to that? Like access to, um, to mobility and um, to, to transportation and access to green space. How those are all things are happening now in the new environment that we are living? What are we going to change? What, are the, what is the role of the planners, city planners, the urban planners in that? So we see that. Um, but so, so there are actually, if I can just uh, summarize, we, I can say that there are a lot of changes in the way we view the physical in infrastructure after COVID, but also we see soft dimensions like how we need to change governance, how we need to change the communication, what is the role of um, behavioral, um, you know, the behavioral insight and behavioral change, what is the role of the public engagement, all those same things suddenly, you know, uh, health sectors and the environmental sectors have to be, you know, um, specialized in those things. So I think that there is also a call for new skills. It's a definitely we need to reevaluate the professional profiles of the environment and health sector. Thank you. Thank you, Sinaya. Okay. Uh, uh, Martin, you wanted to say, sorry. And who's, uh, sorry, go ahead. I mean, our, for instance, our young researchers, uh, doctoral students, postdocs, have been massively affected by the crisis. And we know that they've been massively affected by the crisis. One thing is they had no access to their labs, but they had ch some of them had children, they were isolated. I mean, lots of things happened. So we, we've really come to understand, you know, how sort of global how we must think about these issues globally and not just, you know, can you publish your next paper in science, but th that there is, that actually scientists are human beings, which is we, uh, something that no, we, I'm, we I'm not completely sure about that, <laughs> but, but I've heard, but. <laughs> yes, well, yeah, I mean, partly, at least partly human, right? So th this is, I think, and also we have seen in the difficulty of, say, the dialogue between science and society about whether vaccination is really good or not good, you know, how much we have to work harder to communicate with society, because if we come as scientists saying it's good to be vaccinated, it just doesn't work. Thank you very much, Martin.
So, uh, ah, the, ah, Denise, you want to make a question. Denise is a scientific director of IOS Global. Please go ahead. Yes, hello. Hello, everyone. I would very much like to be with all of you there today. I've been following online, and thank you very much for a very, very rich uh, discussion and presentations. I had a question uh, for all, and specifically also for uh, Nathalie. And I think Sinaya also referred to this in the, talking about silos, is that um, with health system strengthening, particularly in low middle income countries, there's traditionally been an issue it, that it's been, the funding has been fragmented across disease specific funding. And so uh, the question is here um, to all and also with respect to Panther, is, is, is this, this an opportunity to kind of uh, break this and go for health system strengthening as, and here we're talking about low middle income countries, uh, as uh, all across the board and make a great leap forward in this sense that it's not uh, be dis fragmented by disease specific um, funding. Thank you. Thank you, Denise. Uh, Sinaya, you want to respond? Uh, I think you were mentioned, no? Who wants to respond? Who? Uh, Natalie, please go ahead. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. I'm here. <laughs> thank you, Denise. I think you almost answered yourself in the question you asked, right? But, uh, but uh, yeah, you're totally right. I think, you know, if you bring lab capacity, if you bring ECG capacity, if you bring X-ray capacity, if you bring all things that, you, that are needed to conduct solid research, uh, if you have uh, digital tools, if you have... Uh, um, people who are trained in understanding and doing resuscitation, which you don't see everywhere. All these things are contributing to health strengthening. So I think, yes, uh, research brings added value that is uh, sustainable. And th this might sound theoretical. We know for our examples, you know from your, your examples, and we know from our experiences in other diseases how true this is that you know, if you bring a piccolo machine, that piccolo machine will allow to do biochemistry that was never done before in some of the places. So, and that's the type of investment that will be sustainable. It looks simple, um, maybe, but it's, it's, it's the simplest things that are sometimes missing and that will bring this capacity on top of having human uh, uh, research and resources capacities as well, having a nurse, having a pharmacist, having a data manager, having you know um, all, all the stuff you need that uh, is not, and this is one of the things, I'll take one minute, but when we developed uh, Anticov, you will remember, Denise, we were discussing how much of data can we ask for the investigators so that they're not totally swamped by right. research things that right. will prevent them from doing clinical uh, care. So you had to find the right balance. So these are all the things we need to think of, but Denise knows very well. Thank you very much. Thank you, Denise, for your question. Please, uh, uh, who, sorry? Uh, Aubrey, I agree with Denise, uh, but, uh, but I think she agrees, okay. Uh, Wesson, please go ahead, uh, if there is a micro. Uh, thank you for all yeah. presenter. Before I ask my question, I have a quick comment. Um, uh, there was one statement mentioned by some of the presenter. This is not Africa. Uh, they refer for Africa as a model for failure. And if this, yes, we have some challenges in the continent. But to be fair, when it comes to COVID-19 response, Africa did something different. And what happened in Africa, it can be a success story. Uh, when it comes to COVID-19, we have a continental structure for coordination and communication between uh, the member states. And this is the first time to be done. And this is done in Africa, not in, in developed countries. And that at the top of this coordination structure, heads of states, part of this coordination structure. Uh, for the first time in Africa, we have pooled procurement mechanism to provide equipment, supplies, and, and vaccine for, uh, for member states. Before reporting the first case in the continent, we invested in preparedness for, for COVID-19. Within three weeks uh, in, in February, uh, once we discovered the first case in the continent, within three weeks we moved from two countries have the capacity to do lab testing to 90% of the countries that are able to do uh, testing. Uh, so 
I think we need to be fair when we start mentioning Africa in, in the term of the response. Um, my question for um, Aitor, uh, when it comes to emergency medical uh, teams, how do you deal with the challenges related to licensing, accreditation, and also medical liability if you are deploying international doctors to, to support uh, other countries? And um, uh, for Natalie, uh, thank you for bringing uh, this uh, platform for um, a clinical trial. We, we in Africa CDC start having consortium for clinical trial related to vaccination, and we have also our team for uh, Public Health Institute and Research Division working in issues related to clinical trial. So let's put our effort together, and I'll put you in contact uh, with the team and see how can we move forward. Thank you. Thank you, Wesam. The first question was for a, for a uh, address to? Aitor. Ah, to Aitor. Okay, Aitor, you go first, and then Natalie. Maybe I was too fast speaking, and then uh, I didn't. Uh, I said very clearly that I, I didn't want to be disrespectful. Uh, it's, uh, it's, but it's uh, you know a kind of, of of question that it was raised all the time here, and what I was saying very clearly was this is what happens when you don't have resources, when you have uh, people which uh, which is uh, even with pe people who is ready to do the things and they are prepared to do it, they they cannot do it. And that was the, 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 the panorama in the first weeks in, in Spain, very clear, and in Italy, where, where uh, you know, they were completely overburdened by the situation, and they, um, you know, and, and, and the issue, and we were, we were saying, we've been living that, and I'm sorry, this is, this is reality in the places, I mean, I just came from Mozambique, where only, uh, you know, only, uh, probably 20% of the population is, is vaccinated, where all, all the, all the problems that we are facing in, in, uh, in more accommodated societies, uh, they are multiplied by 20 in, in, in a place like Mozambique, where you know if the, you have cultural problems and educational problems here, they, they are multiply, multiplied by, by 10. Uh, if there are access, you know you have no uh, you know a PCR uh, laboratory, you need to do like more than 10, 10 hours by car. Which is impossible for most of the people, etc., etc. So we know what we are speaking about, and, and, and but the other, the other hand, first time, and I, I, I also see that first time, um, African governments took the right decisions in the in, in, in the in the moment with the, with the means that they had, and and, and it was very very uh, you know, and, and I think that it has a lot to see with the, with the ability that they, the, the, you know, the, the, the COVID was. Uh, delayed in in, in, Afri in in the expansion in Africa, that very clearly, because for first time, they most of them they realize this this is this is this is something that we can only deal with certain measures that we have on hand, and this is a this this has been a very a very good uh, a very good step, and the second one uh, I don't need to praise, but you know CDC Africa is doing a brilliant job, and and uh, and uh, it's uh, it's. Uh, uh, more and more closer to the problems that they are really around, and this is this is helping everybody to to deal with those things. Yes, very clearly. Thank you, Aitor. Natalie, the second question. I, thi I think it was a comment, right? So I, I, I'll leave time for others. I agree fully, and I'm happy to continue. Thank you very much. Okay, so um, I think that we can stop now uh, 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 quickly for 10 minutes maybe and uh, have the, there is coffee downstairs and then we can continue with the, with the conversation. Uh, uh, just after the coffee, we will, we will have the more uh, the, the, the African and the Latin American perspective and also the local and regional perspective here in, in Catalonia as well as the national with the, with the US and Luxembourg. Okay, so... Uh, Please come back quickly, get, uh, get your coffee, and we, we continue now. Thank you very much.